Um, I'm Rick Weinzerl. I'm an entomologist here, and I'm going to talk about pesticides in general, but insecticides more specifically. And I'm going to use a presentation we've done with our beginning farmer training program, and I've just added some things to it rather than start an entirely different one. So I'll talk a little bit about different kinds of pesticides, how they're applied, uh, ways to practice good stewardship, uh, understanding of the laws. But I do want to remind you, if you are using pesticides other than just in your backyards, uh, taking a pesticide applicator training uh, uh, program would be a good idea for you. And we'll get to that uh, a little later. Um, just a bit of an aside before we do insecticides, uh, there's a million or more species of insects out there. Uh, they represent over half of all living species and 75% of all animals. And yet, even if we call even the tiniest annoying one of them a pest, uh, less than 3% of them are pests. So uh, we don't really want to go on a vendetta to kill every insect in the world. And then we have to say, how serious are they? Uh, they are, in cases, life-threatening. I mean, the mosquitoes that transmit malaria, the fleas that carry plague, and lice that carry typhus have uh, contributed to millions of deaths uh, over the last hundreds of years. Um, there are still cases where insects eat crops and people don't get them, and the plagues of locusts in, uh, in Africa still cause those kinds of problems. Um, there are cases where they're just economically damaging as crop pests, or they're uh, just, or, or in cases other than crops, things like termites and houses. In other cases, they just displease us. Uh, for some reason, not everybody likes insects in every setting, and, and they don't like seeing the fact that an insect had chewed a scar on the skin or the surface of a fruit or a vegetable. So, Yes, there are a small number of pests. How serious are they? Uh, from inconsequential to life-threatening, and it pro that range of importance uh, should have something to do with how we would approach controlling them. Um, how have people gone about controlling insects with insecticides? Well, uh, go back 150 years, and we're at the time when people started to use, and then all the way through the 1900, early 1900s, things like Paris Green that was copper arsenite. Uh, they used calcium arsenate against boll weevil and cotton, and lead arsenate against codling moth and apples. Um, I've used cyanide as a fumigant. Um, so clearly some things that were really, really toxic. And some of them were so toxic, they also caused problems to plants. So they had to be used as a bait on some kind of bran or wheat or flour and applied beside the plant. And with all that, the old adage before we started to see the use of synthetic insecticides was one for the cutworm, one for the crow, one for the grub, and one to grow. That's an old farmer's almanac uh, adage. So things other than insecticides. Uh, for anybody from Southern Illinois, this is Dr. Hull from Carbondale, Illinois in the 1850s with his plum curculio catcher. He rammed it into the sides of trees. The curculios fell from the vibration. They dropped into the umbrella, and every few trees he dumped it into a big pail of kerosene. So it's a bit labor-intensive as a way to control insects. Move forward 100 years. This is 1953 or 57 in Ontario, Canada, and it's people trenching to prevent army worms from moving from a pasture into an adjacent corn or wheat field. And they dug a deep trench with one side that was really steep, and the larvae would try to cross it and not be able to get up on the, uh, the, the next side. Uh, they also dug little holes in the middle of that trench with a post hole digger, and the little guy with the bucket would get a walk along with a post that was just smaller than the hole and jam it up and down in there just like an old butter churn, and what he got to do was squish all the army worms that were in the holes periodically along the trench. Gives you an idea why it is people were enthused about finding uh, synthetic insecticides. Um, we see the first widespread use of DDT actually as a medical insecticide. And in uh, the early 1940s in World War II, actually I guess it would be more like 43, 44, um, 
the first uses uh, directly on soldiers were used to prevent epidemic typhus. It was dusted down their pants, down their shirts, in their helmets. And now we would look back at that and say, that sounds terrible. Um, knowing what I do now, if I had been there, I would have tried to get to the front of the line. Because in fact, until World War II, more people died of epidemic typhus than died from bullets or cannons or anything else the soldiers on the other side did to them. It was the most fatal disease of war uh, for all of history. And it's why the guy who discovered DDT actually wins the Nobel Prize for medicine back then. Now we learned a lot of bad things about it. Uh, we replaced DDT with organo, other organochlorines, then things that would be called organophosphates and carbamates and then a series of other chemistries over the years. But do understand the reason that these became so popular was the alternatives, the older insecticides, and some of the problems that insects caused were serious enough that uh, the, the drawbacks of these products were sometimes uh, just overlooked. Um, so I'm going to cover different kinds of icides, insecticides, fungicides, and herbicides, things meant to kill something. Right? We'll talk about formulations, how they work, whether or not they're residual or systemic, and a little bit about uh, coverage uh, and using sprayers to apply them. A bit on pesticide stewardship and some on laws and regulations about pesticides. And again, most of this will be insecticides, but uh, you probably ought to understand that pesticide law covers all these other things as well. So we have insecticides, fungicides, herbicides, bactericides, rodenticides, antimicrobials, and all of those are regulated as pesticides by the US EPA. And remember, we name them for what we discovered and designed them to kill, but in many cases, they do have toxicity to other kinds of organisms besides just the ones that we use them to control. Um, pesticides are, are uh, mixed in what we eventually call formulations because the active ingredients, the, the chemical that does the killing, is generally not applied in pure form. Uh, maybe because so little of it goes on in an acre, it has to be mixed with a diluent and then mixed with something else to get it spread evenly across a large area. So they're mixed with carriers to reduce uh, risk during mixing and loading, maybe make it easier to get them to disperse or dissolve in water, uh, and provide something that's easy to handle. And that product that you buy is the pesticide formulation. Um, they may be dry formulations, so the one on, ones on the left, for example, are all dry when you buy them. The dusts and the granules may be intended to uh, be used without uh, mixing. The wettable powders and soluble powders are mixed with water. And in the case of these, if it's a dry material when you buy it, the number in front of a letter tells you the percent of the product you buy that's actually an active ingredient. So 5D is 5% dust, 15G is a 15% granule, 10WP is a 10% water, uh, a wettable powder, something that you mix with water but it doesn't dissolve. On the right hand side are a couple of formulations that you buy as liquids. One is an emulsifiable concentrate, the other is soluble concentrate. In the numbers for things that are sold as liquids tell you the, the uh, pounds per gallon that is active ingredient. So in Brigade, two pounds of a gallon of liquid is actually the active ingredient by Fintrin. And then there are other formulations as well. That's how, what you see when you buy the product. Realize that the chemical you buy is going to be known by it by three different names. One is the chemical name. So on the left, one naphthal methyl carbamate is seven, the typical garden insecticide. Its common name is carbaryl, and it's sold under a lot of trade names, but the initial ones were seven, say as a wettable powder or an emulsifiable concentrate. The chemical on the right, which I will not attempt to read all of that, uh, that is the chemical name for a substance whose common name is azadiractin. It's a plant-derived chemical sold often in, in products that have the word neem in the label in some place. So 
Realize that you might buy the same active ingredient by a number of names, especially trade names, and it's always worth knowing what's actually in it. So here's a label for Brigade. It's a restricted use pesticide, and by weight, uh, it's 25.1% by Fintrin, and that's two pounds in a gallon of product. Uh, the fact that it's restricted use we'll come back to later. But that's what the labels look like. Um, how do these things work? Most insecticides are nerve poisons. They either interfere with nerve transmission in a synapse between cells or along the axons or the fibers that, that uh, transmit nerve impulses. And in general, they have at least some toxicity to humans, but our exposures are less and our detoxification systems are generally greater. And the way they can be used with relative safety is to make sure our exposures aren't too great. There are other special kinds of uh, insecticides that are not nerve poisons. A number of them are pathogens or growth regulators or hormones that affect insects. All of these things have on their label uh, something called an IRAC number, an Insecticide Resistant Action Committee number. And it says, if you look up what the number means, it says these, these insecticides work in a certain way. And you probably shouldn't use one insecticide over and over again, or insecticides that have the same mode of action number over and over again. And you can look those up if you choose on the link at the bottom. The same thing is true for fungicides. There are 12 different mode of action groups. Um, and in general, uh, some of the newer fungicides are much more prone to resistance than the older ones. The older ones were much more general and acted in multiple ways of action. So when we think of fungicides and farmers use them in crops, or gardeners or vegetable and fruit growers use them in crops, they would be used with the idea that we don't use a single mode of action uh, over and over again. The other thing that you'd probably want to know about fungicides is whether they are just protectants or whether they are also eradicants. And a protectant means it has to be on the surface of the plant before the fungus penetrates. Uh, it does not kill anything that's already started. And eradicants actually give a little bit of kickback, although infections that are clearly internal, the fungicides don't stop then either. But some do provide a little bit of, of kickback to kill just starting infections by fungi and crops. And then for herbicides, there are the same thing happens. So we had an IRAC committee and IRAC numbers. We had a FRAC committee for fungicide resistance action. And there's an ARAC one for herbicides. And again, farmers are encouraged not to use the same mode of action over and over again, or the same product. The importance of that, I think, is probably true to any of you who understand that all the Roundup resistant soybeans and corn out there led to almost uniform application of Roundup all around the countryside. And now we have Roundup resistant weeds because of that constant and repeated use. You might ask, how long does a pesticide last? Sometimes the residue is a few hours. Sometimes in certain conditions, it's a few years. Um, and that differs with temperature and moisture and light. And the greater the temperature, the moisture, or the light, the faster they break down. You could logically ask, is a pesticide something that just lands on the part of the plant and stays there, or does it move? And things that move into the plant and then move through its vascular system are called systemic. So admire is a neonicotinoid insecticide that moves from roots up into stems and leaves of plants. Roundup is systemic and moves from leaves down to roots to kill them as an herbicide. Um, you might ask, is a pesticide selective or broad spectrum? Um, the ones that are selective kill only certain groups of insects or certain kinds of weeds. Um, some of these are things like the pathogens, like Bacillus thuringiensis, that kills just the caterpillars that eat it, at least for the normal formulations, the common ones. There are things that might be called reduced risk pesticides, because although they aren't maybe specific pathogens, they tend not to cause problems to humans or vertebrates or birds. Alticor is one of those, or corrigin that's used in fruits and vegetables. It's very safe to most non-targets, except for a few different kinds of caterpillars and certain other insects. Um, 
the selective ones would kill some plants but not others and all of you who understand that 2,4-D is used in lawns to kill broadleaves and not kill uh, grass understand that idea and you may know that there are lots of herbicides with yet uh, more specific levels of, of uh, selectivity. And there are some things that kill pretty much everything. <laughs> Insect, weed, disease, doesn't matter. Uh, methyl bromide is an old fumigant that's been used in that way. And it really is a biocide, not a, an insecticide or a fungicide. It pretty much kills everything. So how would you know what it is you're going to spray in a given crop? If you are a commercial grower, and I'm going to keep this to just the fruit and vegetable side of things, there is a Midwest Tree Fruit Spray Guide and then a guide to uh, organic production that comes from Cornell. Both of these provide listings of what works against what problems. Um, and of course, the organic listing is more brief because there are fewer products that can be used in that way. Um, there are spray guides for small fruits in the same way. Realize that organic producers can use pesticides that are called uh, OMRI approved, Organic Materials Review Institute approved. They typically are plant derived compounds or compounds of some other natural origin and not things that are synthesized from uh, laboratory chemicals or from petrochemicals. It doesn't mean they're completely non-toxic. In some cases, it doesn't mean they're less toxic, but it does mean they're usually of natural origin. For vegetables, there is a Midwest Vegetable Production Guide, and there are several Cornell guides for organic vegetable production that list specific things to do about specific insect or disease problems. And then for the folks who are backyard gardeners, uh, there is a publication that's sold by Pubs Plus on campus, and pretty much all of the extension offices have it. Uh, that's pest management in the home landscape, and it will provide some listings of insecticides, a few fungicides, certain herbicide uses that are more appropriate for homeowners. So all of these guides are really valuable. In the end, you have to follow the, read the label and follow the directions. Now, just a little bit of insight on following the directions or not. Um, all of the restrictions on a pesticide label are things you have to follow. Sometimes the list of target pests on a pesticide label is a little bit ambitious, a little bit too inclusive. Um, this is true for organic or OMRI approved products as well as the synthetic ones. They will list things, they may say for the suppression of, and probably a good number of those insects are not controlled very effectively by those sprays. So be a little careful believing that everything on the label is controlled just because it's listed there. However, everything else you have to follow. Uh, you can't use more than the rate that's listed on the label. If it says don't apply it to blooming crops or weeds because it might kill pollinators, don't do that. Uh, there are some products that move in water and leach into aquifers. And depending on your situation, if you live in a, in a sensitive area, you might not use them. They all have something called a pre-harvest interval, the number of days between application and harvest, so that the residues that you put on a crop dissipate to the point that they don't present a hazard. There are re-entry intervals for places where we're talking about commercial farmers with employees that then go back into a field or the farmer himself or herself to make sure that the residue or the danger is dissipated enough that there's not a problem. And there are on labels uh, certain requirements for posting signs so that workers know uh, crops have been sprayed. So how are all these things used? This gets us back to some things that are probably fairly practical, be it homeowner scale or a larger scale. <coughs> you can apply them to soil or seed for either killing stuff in the soil or coming up into plants. You can apply soil fumigants. You can apply uh, pesticides to leave stems or fruits either to kill what's there or to last a while or to move into plants and, and be active elsewhere in the plant. And there are some things that are used as fumigants. And you aren't going to do that last one, but it's probably worth understanding how those are used. So if you think of things that are soil applied or applied as seed treatments, uh, sometimes you put them on the seed or in the soil to protect against the things that would eat it before germination. Uh, think of things like seed and root maggots, rootworms, cutworms. And 
uh, if they're applied to the soil, they're typically incorporated a little bit, or they may be applied in transplant water or irrigation water. Point is, they leave a residue for several days to a few weeks and kills what's there. Now, the products typically used in this way in, in agriculture have been the old organophosphates like Lorsban and Counter, but some of you will at least remember when diazinon was used widely that way by home gardeners. Uh, there are still some products out there, but its home garden uses are pretty well gone. Um, but those are meant to kill the insects that are in the soil. And in some cases, you can uh, reliably detect or predict that that's needed. There are, uh, in general, for all of the things that are applied to soil, if you've ever heard that all the corn and soybean guys apply a soil insecticide, or some do or used to, at planting to kill the insects, the, the, the rootworms that would feed on roots, typically these products have soil lives of around, or soil half lives of around 30 to 90 days, meaning, in 30 days, they break down to half the amount that was, was put on. Another 30, half, a, half of that yet, and they keep degrading. Realize that that's probably an ideal in that 30 to 45 day range. It means they last long enough to do what they're supposed to, but not so long they persist and cause problems forever. Typically, they don't move very much in water, but they also aren't bound so tightly to soil that the insects don't pick them up. And so what have the historic problems been? It was with all those old uh, chlorinated hydrocarbon compounds we used, like aldrin and dieldrin and heptachlor and chlordane, who had soil half-lives of a few to several years, and then some that were soluble and moved in water. Fortunately, none of those are allowed to be used that way, and they aren't around anymore. But if you think about the way these were used, uh, this is an old picture. There's no such thing as a commercial corn planter out there for the big guys now that this small. But if you look at this older planter, the box behind the one where the guy is pouring in the seed was meant to be a, 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 the place where an insecticide might be added, and it was metered out over the top of the row and incorporated lightly when they planted. So that was a soil residual insecticide. The same thing is true, by the way, when we put insecticide barriers around the outsides of houses to keep eastern subterranean termites from infesting structures, and that is a standard building practice uh, in much of the lower two-thirds of the Midwest and any place south of that. You could sometimes apply these insecticides to seed because if you did that, they would cost a lot less than if we even treated just a seven-inch band, let alone broadcast them every place. So yes, there are seed treatments that have gone on that are meant to protect against seed corn maggot, other root maggots, wireworms, etc., and some uh, fungicidal seed treatments as well. So those are common uses. And if you didn't know it, anytime uh, you buy commercially treated seed, be it with an insecticide or a fungicide, it always will have uh, some kind of dye on it, and that means you shouldn't be using that for anything else. Uh, you shouldn't feed that seed. You should use it to plant, but it's not food because it's treated with a, with a poison, simply. There are pesticides that are applied to the soil or seed to be taken up systemically. Uh, for most fruit and vegetable growers, the only thing out there where we do that is there are some cucurbit seed treatments or soil treatments that come up into plants to, to kill uh, cucumber beetles that feed on seedlings shortly after uh, the plants germinate or transplanted. And they work to varying degrees for just a short time. And there are a couple of fungicides that are used in the same way, uh, not so much in uh, most fruit and vegetable production, except uh, the one here for sweet corn. Um, let's go back up for just a second. Do realize that there is a big issue going on right now about the neonicotinoid fungicides that are applied to seeds for soybean and corn, and they come off the seed because they're applied as a dust or a talc, and they come off during planting, they are, you know, ubiquitous because of the, the vast amount of planting done in a short time, and they may settle in places that end up causing bee problems, bee poisoning. That's a big issue. Uh, do understand that uh, not all neonicotinoids are that toxic to bees, but some of them are. And um, 
also understand that there's various ways people are trying to deal with that, probably not fast enough by anybody's assessments, um, but pay attention, keep watching it. It's uh, got a lot of details and nuance uh, about the problems that can go with treating seeds. Um, there are soil fumigants used to kill uh, insects and pathogens and weed seeds in soil. Uh, they're really expensive. You ought to know it happens because, in fact, a number of the produce crops that we receive from Florida or Texas or California may be grown in fumigated soils. It just doesn't happen much here because we get some winter and we don't grow some of the crops that they do. Uh, but methobromide has been a typical soil fumigant, and the way those are used is they are uh, injected as a gas, uh, through knives or coulters in the soil that are running below the surface, uh, and the soil is immediately covered with plastic, and it holds the fumigant in for a few days. The plastic is removed, the fumigant dissipates, and then we would go in and plant a crop in that space. So that's what a soil fumigant looks like. How about ways herbicides are used? Uh, you could think of things that are pre-plant and, quote, burn down herbicides. And any of you who have used Roundup in a yard or a garden or someplace in waste areas around on your property and you said, I want to kill the weeds there, if you've used Roundup, you've used a non-selective herbicide. Uh, Roundup is systemic and goes down and kills the roots. Gramoxone is not. Gramoxone is also called Paraquat. And it's a restricted use product because although it's an herbicide, it's highly toxic to vertebrates, us included. But there are herbicides that are used that are selective. Atrazine is the one that was widely used in sweet corn or in corn period until Roundup Ready field corn came along. Um, they may be applied pre-emergence or pre-plant for different herbicides. And they may kill uh, small uh, weed, small weeds that germinate from very small seeds better than larger seeds in some cases. They may kill germinating seeds, but not plants that are already established. There are all sorts of reasons why they give some degree of selectivity. But in fact, uh, they've also caused problems over the years. So while Roundup has been a big issue in some ways, uh, environmentally Roundup is probably less troublesome than some of the herbicides it replaced. So there are pre-emergence, post-emergence herbicides, and I'll probably not go further with that because I'm the bug guy primarily. Um, there are foliar applied insecticides that we use really with not much intent they're going to last very long. So if we said we spray them today, they kill what's there, and they're pretty much gone tomorrow, some folks would call those knockdown insecticides. It's not very often people want to do that. In fact, in most cases, you'd like to say, I'll spray this crop to protect it. I hope it'll last four or five days for the insects that keep coming in that are pests. And then in a week or two, I'll look again and see if uh, I need to spray again, but I'd like it to last a few days. There are some products that simply don't last very long. It includes a number of the OMRI-approved products for organic uh, control pyrethrins like pyganic especially. The soaps only work on things that they contact when they're wet. The oils we use only work when they're wet and, and hit the insect while they're applied. So those are really short-lived. Sometimes people choose to use something that's very short-lived because that means they can apply it close to harvest and the PHI may be very short and so they'll still be able to harvest in just a couple of days. Now do realize that PHIs are related to the rate of breakdown and safety of residues on the crop, not to the safety of the applicator. So if it has a one-day PHI, that doesn't mean it's so safe you don't have to worry about uh, getting yourself covered in a, in, a, in a pesticide. That's not the way to look at it. Most of the time we apply insecticides on foliage with the idea they'll last from, say, three to ten days. Um, Generally, they aren't very water soluble, so they last for they last through a, a, a light rain. They don't generally wash off. As you get up over a half an inch to an inch of rain, then yes, most do wash off. And most of them do not have to be eaten to kill insects. Most of them kill insects that crawl across them. 
And so, you know, if you looked at how these are applied, they may be from sprayers and uh, and something like green beans in the top. Uh, they may be applied with air blast sprayers in orchards or vineyards. They might be applied by aerial application in, in large field crops. Um, and of course, then they might be applied the way a lot of, uh, maybe some of you on the, on the uh, webinar here would do them uh, at the small scale by backpack sprayers or hand pump sprayers. Um, and these work fine on the small scale. Uh, realize if you start to say, I'm going to grow a half acre uh, orchard and I'm going to spray it all with a backpack, uh, that that grows old quick. And uh, it also means you have a greater chance for exposure than you probably ought to. Uh, you can move up a little bit to the 15 or 30 gallon uh, tanks that are run off 12 volt batteries. Uh, they can be mounted uh, either on a three point hitch or on small pull behind uh, units. Um, so there's various ways you scale up from uh, those smallest backpack and canister sprayers. Um, but then by the time growers actually get to more than even just two or three acres of something, they end up having to go to different scales. If you grow two acres of sweet corn, you pretty much need a sprayer that can drive through it when it's too high uh, to drive across with a low clearance tractor. Uh, as you go to vineyards and orchards, they have to use air blast sprayers that help use air to push the insecticide and fungicide in through the dense canopies. Um, there's lots of fungicides applied in similar ways in commercial crops. Again, they may be protectants versus eradicants. We talked about that briefly. But something you ought to know if you do grow any crops or anything commercially that uh, is that needs a fungicide applied to it, that the basic idea is you have to get very good coverage with most of them because the fungal spores don't crawl around all over the place to uh, come in contact with a residue like an insect might. So uh, instead, you end up having to get very thorough uniform coverage to make most fungicides work well. Uh, there are some systemic products that are insecticides. I think in the name of time, I'll probably skip those and just talk on one last thing briefly uh, that you're aware of is a way people use insecticides in and around homes, and they would be called aerosol space sprays. Examples are the old uh, bombs that you push the button on in an aerosol can, and it catches, and you leave it sit in the back porch of the old uh, farmhouses where we had livestock all over the farm, and it killed the flies that were pretty numerous in the back porch. Um, same kinds of things as that might still be used with certain uh, very short-lived insecticides in them in packing houses or cider rooms around uh, apple cider facilities. They may even be used in some of the, the uh, flour mills when the lines aren't running. They, they sort of fog the area, uh, kill the insects that are present, and then dissipate real quickly. Now, don't confuse these with fumigants because, in fact, these are just tiny, tiny little uh, droplets of liquid and they float through the air and they deposit on closed surface, on exposed surfaces. And if that's an insect's cuticle or a, uh, you know, the, the inside wall of a livestock operation and the fly then crawls around on it, yeah, it'll kill them. But it doesn't move into cabinets or drawers or things like that. And true fumigants do because they actually move as gases. So these are examples of the way people have used aerosols. They used to fog feed lots sometimes for fly control. Uh, the guy in the lower left, you know, imagine this is a site for the on-farm wedding and there are mosquitoes and flies every place. This was an appropriate way to try to reduce those numbers the day before the, the big event on the farm. The one in the upper right is a is a, an emitter that would be in a food processing plant that runs on the weekend when there's two shifts of no workers there all in a row. The one on the bottom comes from an old organic gardening magazine, and it was for a, not only the uh, device, the mist blower, but also for the product that was supposed to go in it, and it was supposed to be completely safe to everybody. And the big X through that says, folks, if you know anything about pesticides, don't get them on you. I don't care how safe somebody says they are or are not. So bare arms, bare face, uh, bare legs, ankles, and open-toed shoes, don't go with any kind of pesticide application ever, period, end of story. 
Um, we'll sort of skip space and commodity fumigants and get to some things that might be a little uh, more germane to small-scale farmers or to backyard gardeners. Um, pesticides are toxic to non-target organisms. Most of them are to some degree or another. And in fact, folks, if we uh, are honest about it, everybody who uses pesticides says, uh, I know they have pluses and minuses, and what I try to do is minimize the problems. And one of the things you remember is that pesticides may be toxic to bees, especially insecticides, a few fungicides. Um, they may reach non-target organisms by way of drift, uh, by runoff in water, by leaching through the soils. And if we use them too much, we have problems with, with resistance. So a basic idea is what do you do to minimize those problems? Uh, you try to design farming systems that reduce problems, so crop rotations and cover crops and diversity. And even with that, there are some insect pests that would cause serious economic loss, be it fruits and vegetables or field crops. Um, and in those cases, if you choose to use pesticides, that's what they're there for. But it doesn't mean you design a system that guarantees you need them, or at least we'd prefer people didn't do that. Um, you'd use sort of optimum cultural practices when you think about pruning and, and tree fruits and, and uh, things like blackberries and blueberries. Pruning helps you open up canopies so that airflow is better and fungicides are less necessary. And when you do have to spray something, the spray can actually get to where it needs to go. Uh, we tell people to monitor for insects and not say, well, you know, I always get this insect every year when I do such and such, so I'll just spray a few times and make sure it doesn't happen. It doesn't take that much to look and see when it's there and then do what you need to. And there are guidelines for all of this in the production and spray guides I showed uh, earlier on. Um, yeah, these are pretty obvious. Spray when you need to, not when you don't. Uh, spray where you need to, not when you don't or where you don't. Uh, if you have something on tomatoes in one part of the garden that needs to be controlled, doesn't mean you have to con spray the entire garden or the other side of the yard. And then you rotate among products. Um, you try to prevent drift by not applying when there's a high wind. Uh, you might apply in certain ways to do that. You don't treat waterways. You don't treat the neighbor's yard because you'd rather kill the flies and mosquitoes in his yard. That's not appropriate. Um, and whenever you use something that says don't apply to blooming crops or weeds, remember it means that because the bees are foraging in those crops. Um, there are issues with human toxicity for insecticides. Um, and in fact, that's why we say always follow the protective uh, recommendations. Do understand that the tests for these are done to say if they're handled correctly, they're applied far enough before harvest, and you allow residues to dissipate, that we shouldn't really have big problems with safety to either the applicators or to consumers. If you break those rules, you increase those risks. So that's why the labels say what they do. Um, if a label says you can use this on apples but not peaches, then in fact that's true, if it doesn't list peaches on the label. If it says don't spray within so many days of harvest, and you do, that's what results in, in excessive residues that are above accepted tolerances. Um, and the label for these is the law. When you buy brownie mix from Betty Crocker and you decide to use twice as much as it, of something as it says you're supposed to because you like it better that way, uh, nobody's going to take you to court for that, at least in general. If you decide to use a pesticide and say a little is good, a lot is better, and uh, in some way that is detectable, you can be taken to court, you can pay fines, and you can spend time in jail. And that has happened to people at the commercial scale as it should. So how do we get these labels that say, here's where you use it, here's where you can't? Uh, those are approved by the US Environmental Protection Agency. And they are the ones who then say how many uses, how many applications, uh, they establish what the tolerance, along with the, with the Food and Drug Administration, what the tolerance should be on food, what small amount could remain and be safe. 
and then that's what gives rise to the, the use instructions that go with those products. Some states can be more restrictive. Typically, uh, New York and California are in that category. We are not. Uh, we do charge fees to companies to register, and that's what pays for pesticide applicator training programs. Uh, when you buy a pesticide, it may be a, quote, restricted use or general use pesticide. Uh, the general use ones can be purchased by anyone with no proof of training. Uh, that includes products you buy at the local hardware store or big box store or garden center. Uh, but it also includes some that are sold by typical agrochemical dealers that are simply products that are not considered to be of such high risk that applicators have to have a license. Then there are ones that are called restricted use, and to buy those, uh, the person managing the operation uh, must have a pesticide applicator's license. And they, those products can't be sold to anyone who does not have a license. Getting a license for a commercial grower typically opens the door to use some product that in the end are going to work a little better in many cases, and if they're handled correctly, shouldn't present any undue risk. So for anybody who's trying to become a new small farmer, uh, I would strongly encourage you to get a pesticide applicator's license. And then finally, if you buy something in the local Lowe's or Home Depot, and on the label it says, not for commercial use, technically that means that you should not be applying that to something you are then going to sell. So if you buy one of those products, apply it to your tomatoes, technically your tomatoes should not go to market. Um, it might be mostly a technicality, but I do want to remind you that's true. And technically, again, if somebody came along and uh, the EPA or the FDA person does the market basket survey or the compliance survey, comes and buys a little of your stuff at your farmer's market stand, and it turns out it has a pesticide on it that shouldn't have been used on that crop if it were grown commercially, uh, you can be fined for those. So eh, be aware, that's what the laws say. So uh, one or two slides left. Uh, there are things called private versus commercial licenses for people. Some folks in our new farmers class typically think that if they're going to be commercial farmers, that means they need a commercial pesticide applicator's license, and that's really not true. A commercial license is for an applicator or the operator who works for him to be able to go out and custom apply pesticides on somebody else's property and charge for it. So all the guys who run those big spray rigs up and down corn and soybean fields in the spring of the year, many of those are custom commercial operators and they have to have, or applicators, and they have to have a license that corresponds with the kind of thing they do whether it's field crops or power line right away or turf for the guys who are doing lawn care in towns. Farmers need something called a private applicator's license, and that is an entirely separate thing. Uh, the training is quite simple, similar to an operator's license. You can get materials to study for these and go get training and take the tests. And that's offered by the training by U of I Extension in most cases, and testing is done by the Illinois Department of Agriculture. And the website here gives you a link, or the slide gives you a link to the University of Illinois' Pesticide Safety Education Program, and uh, that PSEP program uh, website will show you, if you look under private applicator training, will show you when there are clinics held, where you can take training, and in ways that you can simply get the materials, uh, study, and go take the exam independently. So that's what I had for slides here, and I know I covered a lot. And what I didn't do is say, what should you spray to kill cucumber beetles on squash? Or what should I do to kill Japanese beetles on maple trees? Um, sorry, I didn't do that. There are too many of those questions. I'd refer you to the references. But uh, at this point, I could take some specific questions if you want. I see the one that says, is in trust effective for organic fruit pest problems? Um, yes, some of them. Um, 
if we say fruit pest problems, let's think of things like peaches and apples first, then I'll go further. Um, and trust is pretty effective. And for small scale organic production, just a few trees, if you're growing um, uh, apples or peaches and you need to keep codling moth or oriental fruit moth out of them, the typical worm in the fruit, then the answer is yes, it's a pretty good product. It's pretty good there. It's not really very effective against a couple of other common problems, uh, say stink bug and plant bug damage in peaches, the stuff that just cause them, causes them to grow uh, in a distorted fashion. And it's not really very effective um, against, say, plum curculio in apples or peaches. Um, in small fruits, uh, it is probably the best of the choices you have for the new insect in blueberries and brambles, the spotted wing drosophila, the little tiny maggot in ripe fruit. So in trust probably is the best choice there. Mostly it's good to kill caterpillars. Uh, it does have a few other things it works against. And in the case of uh, spotted wing drosophila, it's the best of the Omri products you could use. The next, is there an organic option for prevention of damping off? Uh, you're outside my expertise here. I'm mostly the, uh, the bug guy. Um, general answer is, in terms of, of uh, uh, anything for transplant production in greenhouses, try not to overwater them. Make sure you use, if possible, either a soilless plant mix for those uh, for growing transplants or that you uh, use something that's sterilized uh, you sterilize plastic trays from one year to the next um, in terms of outdoor try to wait and plant into as warm and well drained a soil as you can which of course uh, that doesn't always happen and beyond that somebody else should probably take on the damping off because i ought to confess to being a bug guy and not a plant pathologist when we get to that um, one says when you use seven, it says do not apply five to seven days before you harvest the crop. Do you wash, just wash the product off if you want to harvest in that period? No, you don't use it in that time frame. If that's what it says, uh, then that's what you are bound by. Now, is anybody going to tell you uh, that the pesticide cops are going to come into your backyard and say, oops, you sprayed that one day too close to harvest. Uh, we're going to take you to jail because you harvested and ate it on your own and you shouldn't have. Oh, but in fact, most of these don't wash off that readily and they degrade better if you simply leave them out in the, in the field to degrade. What you absolutely can't do is say, I will harvest it, I'll wash it, and then I'll sell it. I'm not encouraging you to eat it yourself. I'm really warning you, don't you dare do that and sell it to somebody else because that's why the label says five to seven days. Um, sorry, that's just how it is. Okay, it looks like we we went through them. Rick, uh, okay. thank you very much for being on. Thanks to everyone else for being on and uh, looking forward to uh, next week's session. And um, um, like I said, glad to have everyone on. Rick, appreciate it. Everybody have a great, safe, uh, warm week if you can here in Illinois. Very, very cold. Everybody have a great day. Thanks.